The following is a program of the Santa Barbara County Education Office. To learn more, visit sbceo.org. Hi, I'm Susan Salcido, Santa Barbara County Superintendent of Schools, and I'm so delighted to introduce my guest today, Bridget Boblitz. In 2015, Bridget was named a Superintendent of Los Olivos School District, and one year later, the school received a National Blue Ribbon Award. Very, very exciting. Congratulations thank for that recognition, and thank you for being here. Thank you for inviting me. My really, pleasure. Really excited to talk with you and about your career and your background and the experiences you've had at Los Olivos. But uh, let's start a little bit uh, back in time. Let's talk about um, the fact that you grew up in Reading and then decided to go to Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. What, what made you uh, decide to go to Cal Poly? So I uh, initially started at a community college mm -hmm. at first, and then what I was drawn to at Cal Poly was their motto. They have a learn by doing model. And for me, I, I just was, that appealed to me. I wanted to go and, and experience learning firsthand and not just necessarily from a textbook. So I was drawn to Cal Poly, attended Cal Poly. Uniquely, while I was there, my husband also was there, and we had our, both of our children while we were in school. Oh, so wow. we faced some challenges, but got through it and both graduated and continued on um, through that program and then went on to Chapman University got my master's in teaching credential there. That's great. And what did you major in at Cal Poly? I majored in child development. Um, I wanted to focus on how kids learned, how their brains worked versus just focusing on a teaching credential. Mm -hmm. So. And when did you know that you wanted to be a teacher? What drew you to teaching? Education was something that uh, I was drawn to from a very early age, uh, probably about the age of 16, 17. I had a pretty challenging upbringing, so I knew that I wanted to work with kids. I wanted to make a positive impact on their lives. And initially I thought I would go into counseling. I think that's partly why I, why I chose child development. But as I worked through my degree, I realized teaching was really my call and my passion was to work with kids in education. So once you received your teaching credential, did you start right away as a teacher? I started initially substituting, which was a great experience because it gives you an opportunity to explore different grades and different school sites. And then I got my first job as a gate coordinator for San Luis Coastal and uh, did that for about a half a year prior to landing my first teaching job in Cuyama. So my first job assignment was fourth grade. It was in Cuyama, and I was living in Morro Bay at the time, still commuting out to Cuyama. And then eventually, the following year, I got my first job at Los Olivos. Wow, that commute to Cuyama, that's a pretty long one from Morro Bay. It was. Yes. It was about an hour and a half mm -hmm. each way. And again, I had young children at the time home. So it was, it was quite an endeavor every day uh, traveling that highway. And Cuyama is a wonderful school district, and so is Los Olivos. So you found yourself at Los Olivos, also commuting from Morro Bay, I understand, for many years as you were a teacher. How long were you a teacher at Los Olivos? Tell us about your teaching experience there. So I taught in Los Olivos for eight years as the fourth grade teacher. And what a wonderful experience that was. I, I really enjoyed teaching. I loved being in the classroom and seeing the kids and their excitement. Um, yeah, it was just a, a wonderful place to, to be, obviously, I'm, I'm still there. <laughs> and, you've, and you're in different roles, in fact, money, a couple of different roles, principal and superintendent. How did the teaching experience there um, impact or influence or help you in the roles of uh, principal and superintendent? I think having a foundation in teaching is really critical when you want to move over into administration. For me, I had that base. I understood the culture and the community of the school. I had a connection with the staff moving over into administration. And 
in some ways that was a smooth transition and in other ways there were some challenges about moving from a colleague to now becoming you know the administrator but I think that that transition for the most part was really supportive I had a I had a staff behind me and I was able to get in and do the work that I wanted to do and uh, really support the teaching and learning just because I had been on the front lines of teaching. And in 2015, you took on the role of superintendent. For the audience who, who are watching today, tell us a little bit about the role of superintendent at Los Olivos. So the role as superintendent at Los Olivos is a unique experience. We're a small school. We're K-8. We have 137 students, so I wear a lot of hats. Mm -hmm. um, it's a job that requires me to be uh, knowledgeable in a variety of areas, finance, maintenance, daily operations, while still being the leader and the principal of the school and leading the work with the staff. Um, it's work that I really enjoy. I, uh, I kind of found my home there and uh, we, you know, I work with the board and, and just so many facets of the job. It's hard to capsulate it into one thing. I, I find myself, I, I always tell my staff that there isn't a job that I'm not willing to do. So whatever it is, I'll get in and do it. Um, and, and that's part of the role, I think, there. You have to be a jack of many traits. <laughs> I think you described that really well, and you say that you enjoy it, and I, I think that the community enjoys having you as their leader, too. You really are um, so impactful as a leader of the district. Um, and you clearly love Los Olivos. You've, you've spent a lot of um, really important years there as a teacher, principal, and superintendent, and it's a very special community. Um, tell us a little bit about the rich uh, tradition of excellence at Los Olivos. It is a special community, and that tradition of excellence has been around long before I ar uh, arrived at, in Los Olivos. And, you know, it's something that I think that the community, the school community, really rallies behind, that there is this steep tradition of doing what's good for kids, um, providing the best quality education that we can, and having the community and parental support to, to do that work. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, uh, it's a unique place, it's a, it's a large family, and um, it's really a special, special place. I think you captured that really well. Los Olivos is a very, very special place and uh, very focused on its students. And you can see that with the recognition of the National Blue Ribbon School Award. That was given uh, 2016. I, I, I don't even want to say given. It was probably um, awarded and deserved and, and achieved in 2016 is more like it. And you went back to Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. um, I think took a teacher with you. Tell us how you heard about being uh, awarded and about the experience going back to Washington. Certainly. So for the National Blue Ribbon Award, you have to be nominated. Uh, through either a national department of education or through the, the state. And so I received initial notification that we had been nominated through an email. And at that point had really no idea of what, what is this award. Mm -hmm. And gathered a, a team, we worked on the application, applied for it, and got a call. I was actually in a co school wellness summit conference that day when I got a phone call saying you have been, uh, a, you're a recipient of the 26th wow. uh, Blue Ribbon. So that was really, really uh, just a phenomenal experience. It was such an honor for our school community mm -hmm. to, to receive that recognition for all the hard work that our staff has been putting in and just our community, our parent body, our students. And I did take a teacher, we went back to DC. It was election day actually the day of the ceremony so that was a really exciting time just to be in dc in general there was a lot of activity going on and uh, to be in a room with 250 plus educators who were there also for the same award was um, so humbling mm -hmm. and such a such an honor for our district um, heard the national teacher of the year speak what a truly inspiring uh, speaker he was and just um, one of, one of uh, the highlights of my career oh, was definitely wow. receiving that. Wow. Thanks for uh, that context of the day, too. I mean, it wasn't just any day. It was an election day, right. and uh, there was lots of energy in the air, and, 
and there's just so few t schools that are selected for National Blue Ribbon that you're all together and then hearing from the the teacher of the year that's uh, recognized nationally. Pretty special, it very was. special. And so Los Olivos, when you were recognized for that award, you're recognized for particular um, practices. Correct. Um, it's not just award because it's a random sampling of a, an excellent school, it's actually some practices. Can you say a little bit about the practices that were recognized in your award? So we were recognized for academic excellence. Mm -hmm. um, we do have that tradition of performing well and our students are doing well. We, we talked a lot about our collaborative relationships in our application and uh, how our community really works together to support the students of Los Olivos. Mm -hmm. And in the San Inez Valley, there are seven districts, eight, seven, eight districts, including some char a charter school there too. Um, of them all, this is really the first one that's been recognized um, as a National Blue Ribbon School. And I say that because I feel like there's a community of the valley, mm -hmm. not just the community of Los Olivos, but I'm sure the whole community was really celebratory also. They were, were they? they were. Yeah, yeah. my colleagues were, were really uh, gracious with their um, recognition of our, of our accomplishment. Yeah. One of the things that um, I, I've heard you say and I know about Los Olivos is that there are a lot of community partners that rally around, parents and other organizations, businesses that really support the school. Can you talk a little bit about those partnerships or those um, sponsors of your school? Certainly. We have a very active uh, Spartans Alliance and our Los Olivos School Foundation and they're really champions for our school. They, you know, they fundraise tirelessly. Um, and help support our enrichment programs, which uh, we wouldn't be able to offer without their support. Um, we also partner with some local community organizations. We work with Explore Ecology for our gardening program. We work with out Arts Outreach for art in the classroom. Um, and so those are all just wonderful partnerships that we have with mm -hmm. the community to help bring in um, enrichment to the school. Mm -hmm. And I want to talk about the enrichment classes because I've heard you say that uh, many of the what would be called um, uh, not just enrichment but maybe just extra classes are really part of everyone's core classes, visual, performing arts, etc. Can you say a little bit more about those courses that students receive? Yes, so our students um, receive music, uh, art in the classroom, uh, inquiry science lessons, gardening, uh, electives that can take foreign language, and uh, we have a variety of things that we're offering. And for us, it really is, I, I call them enrichment classes, but for Los Olivos, I feel like it, it is really part of our core. It's something that we value in, in offering our students. And um, so we're able to provide that because of the, the dollars that are raised mm -hmm. and to support that those programs. However, I feel like without them, we wouldn't be the same. And, and I don't see our education at Los Olivos not offering them. It's it's truly about creating a well-rounded whole child and, and giving them, you know, exploratory options that are reach beyond just the, the core academics. Mm -hmm. And technology seems to be a big uh, initiative at Los Olivos. Can you share about your uh, technology uh, opportunities for students? I think they have one-to-one -one and is, right. Yeah. So this year we launched a one-to-one -one implementation campaign. Mm -hmm. um, we do have K through second grade. We offer iPads one-to-one, -one, and then third through eighth grade they have Google Chromebooks. And this has been something that we've been really working towards for the last several years. We were able to finally put in infrastructure this summer to help facilitate and you know increase the bandwidth so that these devices can be used. We recently developed a digital technology plan so that we have content and standards for every grade level. And I, I feel like it's a very exciting time for us. We're just starting to really delve into technology in terms of having it daily in the classroom and just becoming an integral part of what's happening versus this external mm -hmm. um, you know, piece that we're, that we're providing. So it's been fun and it's been exciting work and the teachers are, are getting behind it and, and really transforming the learning that's happening in the classroom. It's really exciting to hear about your technology uh, implementation as it occurred this year because it really does take a long-term plan 
you know, it's not something that you say, oh, let's do a one-to-one -one device plan and, and it happens the very next day. It, rather, it takes several years to implement and the uh, infrastructure is one part, the teaching and learning is another part. So it's very exciting to, to see that it's here, you right. Know, right, for your students. And another thing that, that I understand that Los Olivos does is, is it really instills a philosophy around students caring for one another. There's just a real uh, guiding principle that that shifts each year. You might have a saying or a motto or something like that each year. What is that philosophy or saying this year? This year it is a Helen Keller quote. It's alone we can do so little, together we can do so much. And this was an idea that I implemented when I started in administration was to come up with an annual theme to kind of guide our work. Um, this year we're, the quote is focused as, so that we can look at community service. Mm -hmm. We have each class doing a community service project, not only on campus, but also looking to do community service in the local community. Um, how do we serve our students? How do we partner together? And uh, so it's been really inspirational. We do inspirational quotes on the announcements every day. And I have a board, a whiteboard in the staff office that I put up an inspirational quote mm -hmm. each week. Um, and we just really champion behind that to bring the community of the school together. That's great. The community service that students do, is that kindergarten all the way through eighth grade? We started that this year mm -hmm. and they're starting with some projects just on campus. Mm -hmm. I wanted to start there because I feel like they need to take ownership of this is our campus and we want to improve it and make it better. So mm -hmm. kindergarten through eighth grade, everyone has selected something and and they're working towards that. That's great. I, I love how to see the quote in action at your school and in the community. That's wonderful. And an elective that students are able to take is something called creative expression. What what is that elective? Who, so, who can take it? And what what is it all about? So our seventh and eighth grade students can take creative expression. Mm -hmm. And actually, this was a idea that was brought for, forward by our English teacher, Amy Willis. This was her complete idea. She's developed the curriculum and mm -hmm. put it all together. And it is a unique opportunity for our students. It kind of brings in careers and, and college readiness into seventh and eighth grade. So they're working with art and media and writing. And then what she does is she has guest speakers from various professions come in and speak to the kids, specifically about how are they using creativity in their workplace. Um, the students then get to go on a one-day internship of, of their selection, of their choosing, and spend the day. We've had students do an internship with an attorney, with a baker, with a mechanic, with a surfboard shaper, and, um, and then they come back and talk about their experience and put that together in sort of a presentation format. And what we're finding is that students who may be struggling in their core academics, this gives them a chance and an opportunity to choose something that they're vested in and interested in, and it sparks that interest and sparks that creativity. And, and then they're able to apply some of the skills they've learned from their mentors mm -hmm. um, and bring that back. So. so many opportunities for students at Los Olivos. You really seem to maximize the time that they have with you. I mean, they're doing so many different creative things and um, community-oriented and together-oriented things on top of all of the academic uh, learning that they, they do each day. It's very exciting to hear. And parent support. We did talk about your community partners, um, but parents in particular are very active at Los Olivos. And one of the roles or hats that you play, I'm sure, is to keep parents uh, current, keeping them uh, involved, engaged, but also current with what's happening. How do you engage with parents at Los Olivos? Well, I think for one, one way I engage with them is that I'm visible every day. I'm right there. You know, I can see them and, and I have an open door policy. Um, additionally, we use Parent Square Communication as a tool to get the information out about what's happening on campus events. Beyond just informing them of what's going on and being accessible, we, we try to partner with them and bring them in and invite them into our, our school culture. We have, uh, I started a parent lunch once a month. Mm. So we invite parents, grandparents, siblings onto campus. They can join their children and have lunch with them. It's a really special day and, and the kids really look forward to that. Additionally, we have what we call Spartan socials. So they're 
external social events outside of the school day, things like an apple pie making night or an ugly sweater Christmas party, <laughs> movie night on the field. So we're just trying to connect with them, I think, on, on multiple levels, um, which keeps them engaged and, and wanting to be uh, a participant there at school. Sounds like there's a lot of engagement that can occur. Parents can plug in in multiple different ways at Los Olivos. And so let's turn the conversation to, to you. And I know you are a lifelong learner for sure. You attend workshops, you do reading. Is there any particular um, way in which you've continued to learn um, that you'd want to share with the audience? Something that really keeps you on the forefront? I think for me, I, I, it kind of ties back to that initial uh, learn by doing motto at Cal Poly. For me, I find that the, the most uh, encouraging learning experiences that I've had have been watching or mentoring with someone else, um, watching how someone else does something or attending a conference or a seminar where I hear about new ideas and fresh ideas. I get, that inspires me mm -hmm. to, to hear what others are doing and, and you know, I, I read quite a bit, but, but it's those connections and those experiences of, of listening to what others are doing that have truly influenced my, uh, my work. Mm -hmm. And a moment ago, you, you used the word mentor. And um, you know, in, in our professional lives, I'm sure we've had mentors uh, that have helped us or you've helped others as a mentor. Either way, a mentor that's maybe helped you or you've helped someone else, can you share an experience that's really impacted you as far as mentoring mm. um, is concerned? Yes, I think uh, mentoring, I've, I've been both. I've been a mentor and a mentee. Mm -hmm. um, and I think for me, probably in the mentor role, I can think back to a time just in teaching and, and being a, a mentor teacher. And what a, what a great opportunity that was to really reflect on my practice. And um, it makes you become aware of the challenges that you have and, and the good things that you're doing and uh, you know, the ability to help someone else. And um, so that, that for me was a, was a great experience. Mm -hmm. And we've talked today about your, your trajectory in your career. You um, started out as a teacher in multiple different places, uh, principal and superintendent. So you've learned a lot about leadership. Mm -hmm. And uh, in some, some folks will say that leadership is something that people are born with, and others might say it's something that they've uh, learned and developed over time. What do you think about leadership? Is it something you're born with or something you uh, learn over time? I think for me it was probably a little of both. Mm -hmm. I thought about that uh -huh. leadership that I think I was probably a natural leader early on. I always wanted to, to lead and, and to make decisions. But I think as I've become a leader, that skill set has developed over time. What I thought leadership meant now means something very differently than what I, I think I thought early on. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I feel like I'm constantly developing my skills as a leader. And sometimes I question, well, what kind of leader am I? Mm -hmm. You know, because it's changing and evolving and, and it, you adapt as the circumstances change. Mm -hmm. So for me, I, I think it's a little bit of both. It is a little bit of both, I think, as you're saying, uh, for you, and uh, you're clearly excellent at it. What are some of the skills that you're currently thinking about in terms of leadership? You, you said it evolves, but right. for you right now, what are some of the big skills that are, are needed in terms of leadership in, for you? I think for myself, leadership, one of the things I've learned as I've grown in this leadership role is to listen more, mm -hmm. to take time to make decisions I think initially I was quick to make a decision and now I, I take my time, I reflect before I make a decision. Um, one of the challenges I, I'm facing now as a leader is how do, I, how do I brand myself, how do I brand our school? I think that's a new element to leadership that I hadn't considered before so that's something that's currently on my mind and, and developing that skill set as a leader. Um, but again, it's, it's constantly changing. And, and as we acquire one skill, we, we realize we have another skill that we need to, to work on, mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. And what would you say is uh, one of the best parts of your job? I think for me, the best part of my job, honestly, is the kids. Mm -hmm. 
I love being on a school site and being around the students and seeing the excitement and the learning that's happening and, and knowing that the work that we're doing is making a difference. Um, that's why I'm here. And I'm, I'm really curious to know because I know how you're super busy. You have a life outside of work, but a very busy life at work as well. How do you keep a sense of balance? I spend uh, a lot of time outdoors. I love the outdoors. I hike, I bike, run. Uh, we go to the beach a lot. My husband and I are recent empty nesters, so we're traveling more. And I love to read. Um, I've started painting again now that I have no children at home. <laughs> and I'm thinking about possibly learning an instrument. And uh, so I try to find a, a good balance of of uh, downtime. Downtime, very good. When you have it, you right. try to use it really well, it sounds like. So, Bridget, we're, we're winding down our time, and I want to give you an opportunity to address the audience in, um, in any way, but let's, let's first start with students. Is there a message that you would have to the students who are watching today? I think my message to students is to follow your dreams, to work hard, to be uh, with determination and perseverance. You can overcome challenges, and uh, just to put in that hard work and know that challenges, you'll get through them and, and keep plugging on and, and keep after that goal mm -hmm. you can obtain it. Great, great message to the students. And what about for parents? For parents, I would say to continue to advocate for your child, to can you continue to stay involved with your child, um, and to trust in your educators, you know, to, to, to know that they're doing uh, quality work. And what about the community at large? You have a, a vast community who are watching today. You have one in the San Ynez Valley, and then you have your community of Los Olivos. What do you want to, to provide as a message to those who are watching as part of the community? I think I would want to thank the community for their uh, involvement and their resources, and just to encourage them to continue to reach out to schools and to get involved, and that the work that they're doing just supports our work, and thank them for that. Well, thank you for the time that you spent uh, with me today. It's really, really wonderful to hear your story, your leadership. The students and family at, families at Los Olivos are so well served in terms of an academic environment, but the whole child environment that you, you've talked about earlier, and we're so fortunate to have you as a leader in this county and at Los Olivos. Thank you for being my guest. Thank you for having me. I'm Susan Salcido, Santa Barbara County Superintendent of Schools. Thank you so much for joining us today for this edition of Schools of Thought.